Welcome again to another edition of Condo Insider. We have this show every Thursday from 3 to 3.30 to talk about association living. And one of the things that came up last year was whether condominium association managers should be licensed and regulated by the state of Hawaii. But before I introduce our guest, Jane Sugimura, on that topic, I just want to take a short moment as a special tribute to our Congressman Mark Takai, who passed away July 20th of this year at the age of 49 from pancreatic cancer. Those of you who know Mark's professional career would know that he served in Iraqi freedom as a colonel in the National Guard, served in our state legislature for 20 years, was a student body president at University of Hawaii, and was elected to Congress in 2015 to represent the state of Hawaii in Washington, D.C. He had a fabulous record, was well known there in Washington, being a consensus builder. But my point is, I knew Mark personally for many years. And I can tell you things that others may not know. First of all, he was his board of director president for over 10 years and ran one of the best associations in Hawaii from my experience in management. But he also was a fabulous husband to his, his wife, Sammy, great father to his kids, Matthew and Kyla, and frankly was a great friend of mine, enjoyed his company, my beer buddy, somebody who I found fascinating. But the one thing I can tell you about Mark, he always had the best interest of Hawaii in his heart, and he will be sorely missed. So our thoughts and prayers should be to Mark and his family. Anyway, I want to go back and introduce Jane Sugimura, prominent lawyer in our industry, condo industry here in Hawaii. Welcome, Jane. And just re briefly refresh us again about your background. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Richard. And I, I want to add my two cents to Mark because I've known him ever since he was a legislator. I've been active. I mean, he's from my area. You know, I, I live in IAA Pro Ridge. I've been on the IAA Neighborhood Board for almost 20 years. And so I've known Mark all those many years. And I agree with everything you say said about him. And he was a great friend and uh, asset to the community. He, he will be sorely missed uh, by the community. But anyway, my, my uh, background, I'm an attorney. I'm a real estate attorney. Uh, my, the name of my firm is Bendet Fidel Sugimura. Uh, and uh, I don't do condo issues a whole lot, mainly because I'm very active in a nonprofit called Hawaii Council of uh, Community Associations. And so the focus of uh, HCCA is to educate boards of directors and to uh, advocate for uh, bills, a legislation that will benefit condo associations and condo uh, residents. And and uh, uh, sponsoring this show is you know one of the things that we like to do uh, because we want to. It's part of our uh, educational uh, uh, service that we're offering the community. And because semantics was sometimes important. When you say advocate for boards of directors, you're actually are advocating for the owners and the association yes. as a whole on, on good judgment and, and good law and, yes. and good issues. And, yes, and, 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 and we try to, uh, the, one of the purposes is to educate boards of directors so that they can uh, serve their communities better. I know in last year's legislature, and, and really uh, last year was the first year I've seen it really come in, in such a strength, there was a group of homeowners and others who were advocating that boards of directors are out of control, there's a conspiracy theory, and as such, the community association manager, the management company's representative at the board meeting, needed to have a real estate broker's license. So let, let me just ask one question to start out. Yeah. It's my understanding, that, correct me if I'm wrong, that to be a managing agent, which is the law, or the term in the law, you have to be a real estate broker. Is that right or? Uh, no, uh, the management companies have a licensed broker. And, you know, my understanding is the reason for that is uh, so that, you know, they can get the fidelity bond because the managing agents manage the monies for the community associations that they manage. But the employees of the management companies are not licensed. Yeah, well, I think we're saying because the, the management company itself right. has to be a broker. Right. A real estate broker. Right which requires them to have a principal broker. Yes. And the primary notice in the law, which is Hawaii 514B 132, yes, 132, says that it's, it's kind of written around the fidelity bond because that management company controls or holds the funds and trust 
of the client association. And this gives them some protection by having a licensed broker and also them having to have a fidelity bond in case something were to go awry. Right. And, 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 and we're talking about millions of dollars. Uh, you know, uh, and, and if you look at some of the management companies and, you know, they manage hundreds of projects. And so you're talking about a substantial amount of money. And so that's why it's important to make sure that there is a way for the association's funds to be protected. But, you know, what that, what that does is it, it does not require the employees of that management company. To be licensed and right now as a practical matter they're not licensed yeah and we'll come back to that in a minute but i can say you clearly because i was the president of a management company here one mm -hmm. of the larger ones not the largest one and i know that we can we held and trust and manage or protected over a hundred million dollars in money between the reserve fund and the operating account mm -hmm. for the 182 projects that the company i work for managed right. so it is a big responsibility mm -hmm. but the law does say just for everybody's knowledge that not only does the management company have to have this fidelity bond, the association almost also must have a fidelity bond. So there's now another level of protection against the board and the employees of the association. Right. And in essence, they uh, um, add as additional insurance to each other. So you have this uh, cross insurance, for lack of a better technical word. Right. And, and by doing that, then there's a real estate recovery fund. If, if at the end the insurance doesn't pay for it, that an association could apply for. So, right. So in, in general terms, it's pretty protected. Yes. And that, that's only as to the uh, funds that belong to the association. Right. But as you said, and this is the area I want to get into, is, is that the condominium is community association manager, when there is a management company, is not licensed. No. The person who goes to the meeting. No. And... People have, some people, a minority I would say, have advocated that they should have a real estate broker's license. What's your reaction to that? I think that it, what it does is it, it demonstrates a level of frustration because, you know, these are, uh, I understand, to be owners uh, who uh, own units and they may, you know, they, they, they are, you know, they, I know they're unhappy about some of the decisions that their boards make. And what we're seeing is there uh, a lot of decisions now dealing with special assessments? You know that, and 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 it's the board who makes the decision uh, that you know that a repair has to be made, and there's not enough money, and therefore you know they have to specially assess the owners in order to do those repairs, which is something that they're required by their uh, governing documents and the statute to do, and. And because the owners are unhappy about the special assessment, their you know, first reaction is, well, somebody's got to pay for this. Somebody's, you know, this is a bad decision, and we want to blame somebody. And, and so they want to blame. And, and so I think they're looking at the property management companies to say, well, how come you didn't you know, instruct the board to do this and that so that they, we wouldn't have this special assessment. But I think that kind of begs the question because you have to figure out, well, how, why is this special assessment happening? And, you know, I don't think you can, you can blame the, 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 um, the property management company because it's the board who's uh, uh, basically charged by their governing documents and the state law to make these decisions on behalf of the owners of the association. One of my little side jobs is I teach continuing education, which is required for real estate licensees. So I go to the train the trainer course, of which this year the primary emphasis is on the condo statute 514B. So we had all the brokers and the trainers there in the room and this topic came up. It was interesting from listening to the realtors on this topic, the common thread was that the owners don't understand the difference between a real estate agent and a managing agent. You know, a real estate agent is working with a particular client on a specific piece of property and, and has certain obligations and certain training that is required to do that. Yes. A managing agent is more of a company which has a much broader scope of work with the association because the law that was presented to the legislature last year basically said any employee of the management company had to be a real estate broker, which would mean that the receptionist who answered the phone would have to be a real estate broker. The, if the owner called a clerk and said, hey, why do I have a late fee or can you send me a copy of my new ledger? That person couldn't speak to the owner unless they had a, a, a real estate broker's license. 
Where in essence, our scope of work is much fuller in some cases than what a real estate licensee would do. Right. And so it makes it much more complex that the uh, to consider licensing for an association. Right, and, and I don't think, too, the uh, owners, the unit owners realize that uh, the, the different industries, like, you know, residential condominiums, there's an organization called CAI that has course, that has, you know, training and classes and issue certification for people who go through the training and take the test and reach a certain level of uh, ex experience and knowledge. And there's a, another organization called IRAM that does the same thing for shopping centers and for you know commercial warehouses and uh, people in that industry. And so you know there are trade organizations out there that uh, and these are national organizations. And so they do training, they do uh, certifications for their specific industry regarding training of property managers. And and the the uh, owners of the condominiums, you know, need to know that these, uh, th this is happening. And I think it's, it's like any other thing when you go out and you buy a service, you have to go and ask questions. So what kind of certifications do you have? That's how they choose property managers. I mean, if I was, you know, uh, 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 a condominium association. I'd want to know, you know, if 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 I was uh, uh, entering into an agreement with a managing agent, uh, you know, what kind of uh, the community uh, managers, the community associate managers that you assign to our group, what are their certifications? What are their training? You know, I would be very interested in that because that means that we have uh, a person with some expertise, some knowledge that's going to, that is going to be of assistance to the board to help them make their decisions. And that's what the owners don't understand. It's the board that makes the decisions. It's up to the board to go out and get people to help them make those decisions. And the managing agent is only just one of those people, those resources that they should be using to make their decisions. And furthermore, the Supreme Court of Hawaii ruled that, you know, that only lawyers can practice law. So managing agents have only so much ability to advise the board. They can advise the board to talk to their lawyer or their architect or whatever it may be. They don't really have the ability to really act as a lawyer and, and define those things. They're supposed to refer that to a, a licensed lawyer in those respects. But right. what I see as interesting and complicated on this issue is people seem to think of their home, their residential condo. When you look at condos in Hawaii, you have commercial condos, industrial condos, agricultural condos, senior living condos, assisted living condos, parking condos, storage condos, spatial condos. You know, the list goes on. And then you take within that, you have two unit condos, 20 unit condos, 1,000 unit condos. Self-managed condos. Self-managed condos. Right. You know, the scope of work varies so much within that perspective to take one law like 514B, which covers basic uh, transparency type issues and protections for the homeowners or the owners of the condo, uh, really to try to legislate some grand scale educational theme would be really difficult to do. And, and like I said before, there are other organizations out there already doing the training and, and the certifications. So why would you require the state of Hawaii to now take over and duplicate those efforts? And I was involved, in, you know, uh, three or four years ago, I think, in the licensing of security guards that affected condominiums. We're still working on CLE, which is a continuing education requirements for that licensing scheme. And, you know, so I know that the state of Hawaii would be very reluctant to take on uh, the task of licensing condominium or community association management people because you'd have to come up with a criteria of, you know, what kinds of things uh, you know, do you, you know, do they have to uh, have expertise in what kind of training? And, you know, so, you know, it, it, it's something that the state is probably uh, doesn't have the resources to do, and they don't have the inclination to do it because there are other groups out there who are already doing it. Well, this is fascinating, but we're going to take a short break for a minute. We'll be right back with Condo Insider. Okay. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm the host of Research in Manoa, Mondays from 12 to 1 on thinktechhawaii.com. Take a look at us and learn about uh, geophysics, learn about planetology, learn about the ocean and earth sciences at UH Manoa. You'll really enjoy it. So come around. We'll see you then. Hi, my name is Kim Lau, and I'm the host of Hawaii Rising. You can watch me every other Monday at 4 p.m. 
Aloha! My name is Carl Campagna, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I invite you to come watch our show on thinktechhawaii.com. You can also see our shows on YouTube as well, if you can Google search those. I appreciate the time. I hope that you do join us as we learn about education, about the educational system here in Hawaii, what the challenges are, what the benefits are, and how much our kids are learning. So thank you. I hope you join us. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're talking with Jane Sugimura about whether association managers, the representative of the management company who attends the board meeting, should be licensed or not. And we've learned very easily this is not a simple topic because certainly the last legislation where it was proposed that they be a real estate broker, when you think about it, the real estate broker training, how to buy and sell condos, how to write a deposit receipt offer acceptance forms, really has no bearing on what's going on with a condominium association manager. And Jane was reflecting on uh, the issues that happened when the state got involved and tried to make a uh, security guards license for condominiums, which is still dragging on to this day. So how long is that gonna drag on? I don't know, we're still working on rules uh, uh, and definitions, and so it, it still goes on, but uh, the, the first hurdle has been cleared. I mean, there is a law that requires security guards to be licensed and registered, fingerprinted, uh, security checks to be done. So that's all been implemented. Now we're getting into the continuing education part of it. And so if you're an association that employs your own security guard, then you must undertake the same background checks. Yes, and you are required by the state law to, and they have programs uh, that uh, that are sanctioned by the <coughs> state. In fact, part of our uh, task when we uh, worked with the DCCA was to set up a program, an edu a curriculum. And then, uh, then there were uh, different groups that took that curriculum and expanded on it and went out and actually went out and did the education and training for security guards. But the, but the uh, DCCA and the U UH were the ones who developed that curriculum. Well, from your experience, what do you feel DCCA's view would be of manager condominium kind of association? I, I know what their view is going to be. They, 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 their view is that there are people out there who are already doing the training and the certification and that the state of Hawaii does not have the, the, the funds nor the resources to do that. And I think, as I said a little earlier, I think one of the key issues to understand is all types of condos. Right. So what one condo needs for a manager and skill levels and experience is going to be totally different than what another condo might need. Right. And then you throw in the size. There's a large number of condos in the state of Hawaii where they don't have a resident or a site manager because they're small, and it's a two- or three-member, five-member board that is self-managed, and maybe they just take the scope of work and say, management company, all we want you to do is pay our bills and do the financial statement for right. us. And so how do you, I mean, how would the state or how would you, I mean, I mean, that's the question they're probably asking too. How would we, how would we manage this? That, that's yeah. That's that's what you know. I think would be the issue, and you know, it comes down to you know, well, what are you trying to fix? And I think the the people, the proponents of this type of legislation, who want the uh, the uh, management company employees to be licensed, they're looking for someone to basically either be a scapegoat for the decisions made by the board or they want somebody there to tell the board what to do, except that it, it doesn't work that way. The way the, the, the governing documents are set up and uh, 514 A and B, the board is the one that's charged with making the decisions. They have to go out under the business judgment rule and hire people to assist them to make those decisions if they don't know what they're doing. And most of them, because it's a volunteer board, don't know what they're doing, and so they do have to rely on people. So I, I think, you know, with the the ma uh, with management uh, companies, what what the association has to do is to vet the management companies and see what their credentials are and what kind of training and certification, and you know, and 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 choose people that are going to be able to assist them make the decisions for their particular project. 
you know, if it's a, a large project, they may want somebody who has the, uh, the experience of managing large projects with over 100 units or over 200 units. And if it's just a small company, you don't, you know, that maybe that's overkill, you know, to have somebody with that experience. But, you know, the, manage, the management company is the, is, is the person or the, the, the entity that facilitates and assists the, uh, the board in managing their project. I mean, they're not the ones who are actually calling the shots. It's, and I think that's what the proponents of this type of legislation are confused about. Yeah, I agree. I think they believe that there should be somebody they can go to to force the board to do a different decision than the board made, you know, because when I look at a managing agent and I look at the real estate law, as we, as we said, they have to have a broker as the primary person for the, the fiscal side of this. We owe obedience and loyalty to the client under the law. Mm -hmm. And so clients can make bad decisions. We can be saying, we recommend you think about this, and the board can say, no, we want to do that. And to try to say that because uh, they want something in the law that the boards have to listen to us would be kind of counterproductive to the spirit of self-governance and, and who's really responsible for this. Right, and, and you know, I, based on my experience, and I've sat on two boards for many, many, many years, and I've been in the room when people have said, oh, well, you know, somebody says, oh, well, we've got this issue. Why don't we, you know, hire an attorney, send it over to the attorney and get a, a, a legal opinion? And somebody else would say, oh, no, we don't want to pay him. It's like, well, why? We, we're not experts. And I'm an attorney, I sit on the board, but I'm not going to put my, my, my insurance on the line. I'm not going to give legal advice to my board. You know, if I'm there and there's a legal issue, I'm the first one to say, let's get a legal opinion. That way we have an attorney's opinion, and then, then the board can make a decision, because that's what they're supposed to do. And, and so for the person who sits there and says, um, we don't want to do this because it costs too much money, that's a wrong answer, I think, for a board member. I mean, that's abdicating. I mean, because, you know, the board, uh, you know, the, the, the statute says that if you don't know, you're supposed, the business judgment rule says you're supposed to go out and get an opinion, which means you pay for it. It's not free. I mean, and so you should go out and, 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 and hire an engineer or hire an accountant or hire an attorney and pay for an opinion. And maybe you may not agree with that opinion. So you go out and you hire another expert and get another opinion. And you can do this multiple times. And then once you've got all the written opinions based on your knowledge of the building and the project and the people who live there, and you've got all this expert opinion, it's up to the board to make a decision. That's what they're there for. Right or wrong, good or ugly, this is what they do. That's what they're supposed to do. And, and, and so for, for people to say, oh, well, I don't want to get a legal opinion or an engineering opinion because it costs too much money, that's just a it's bad. Just, it's interesting you say that because coming up in September, we have a lawyer know, you know, Richard Ekimoto, <laughs> who gives a course on the seven deadly sins of a board of directors. And one of them is not getting professional opinions and listening yeah. to them. And uh, that'll be in September, and I invite all of you to come back and watch that because that's a quite an interesting show. But in this process, going back to what we were saying earlier about some owners who just want someone else to be able to override the board, and that's where we had this issue come up last year about an ombudsman, right. some person who might have some authority to uh, uh, force them into mediation or some type of uh, governmental uh, management of this. But uh, the reality of it is my, you know, my, my friends who are lawyers always accuse me of a, being a wannabe lawyer because I hang around with them too much. I profess my own theory about this. But it's my belief that there exists when you buy a condominium, a contractual relationship between you and the association, you as an owner. Your declaration and your bylaws are all recorded in a part of your deed. Mm -hmm. That the legislature really can't interfere with that contractual relationship. They can create laws for transparency and those types of things. But to try to undo an existing contract that's been signed, sealed, and delivered between an owner and an association, they couldn't adopt a law to change that. Right. And, you know, the, the people who are the proponents of this type of legislation, they're, they're, they're what we call activists. And I was one. I was, I, I have to admit that I, I joined uh, one of my boards because I was an activist against the existing board that was there. I was asked to assist some homeowners to pass, you know, get, get the board working on some issues. And so that's how I got involved in one of my condominiums. So I understand where they're coming from. But the whole thing about self-governance is that the owners have to understand that they are the catalyst. They're the ones who, uh, who 
uh, decide you know, what types of things happen in their project. And if they don't like what's happening, it's up to them to vote out the people who are sitting on the board. And I have had many people come to me and say, well, that's really hard to do because they're, they're incumbents and they've been there for so long. And, and my answer to them, well, that's too bad. Then you're just going to have to live with that board. And I have helped many groups, you know, do, uh, you know, campaigns to remove people from the board. And it can be done. Uh, it's not easy, but it can be done. And the statute and the condominium governing documents allow you know, for you to remove people that you don't want sitting on the board, that you think are making bad decisions. But it's up to the people who live in that building to make that determination. It's not up to the management company. It's not up to the uh, community association managers to tell the board how to do this. It's up to the people who live there to make that decision. And if you can't get enough people, you know, to even, you know, to, to get involved enough so that they will even give you your proxy so that they, you can go and do whatever you want to do, then, you know, that's self-governance. That, that means that the majority don't care. But in fairness and they're to the happy board, with the, the, what's, yeah, what's happening. But in fairness to the board, they're owners too. Yeah. So when they pass these special assessments, they got to pay the same money as everybody else. Yes. And I'm sure those board members don't want to pay more either, but because they have these professional opinions and, and they have a legal obligation to protect the property, they sometimes are forced to make decisions that are unpopular. Yes. You know, and I know and that's very hard. I know there's a removal of a client association board proposed uh, coming up in September where they had to assess the owners $12 million in a very large unit because of the cast iron pipes failing. Well, th those board members are going to have to pay the same money based on their percentage of ownership as everybody else. And I can sh assure you they didn't want to do it, but the problem is they were faced with, we have a black water or serious environmental problem. And if we don't fix it, the problem is a 20 or $30 million problem. And, and so the board sometimes have to make tough decisions. And these owners who say there must be some other way to fix this are just sometimes hoping and just don't want to pay the pauper. That there right. is no other way. And, and I, I have personal knowledge of that. I mean, I was on one of the, one of the boards that I was on several years ago. Uh, we were in the process of uh, preparing and uh, fixing our uh, parking decks. And that was like almost a million dollars. We had two parking decks. And in the middle of that, uh, we found out, I mean, there was an issue with some, and th this was a wooden townhouse project, and there was an issue with some supports that held up the second floor. And so we hired an engineering firm, and lo and behold, they told us that 51 of these supports had to be wow. replaced. And that's a huge amount of, uh, and when we went out and we got the bids and we went to the owners about a special assessment, naturally the first thing is, how come you guys didn't know about this? How come we're being special assessed? This is your fault. We want you off the board. That was their first reaction. And yeah. let me just say one thing. Yeah. We're running out of time. Yeah. Um, it's a tough job for board members. It we is. understand it's the a owner's very pain, tough job. but yes or no? Should community association managers be licensed? No, I don't think so. All right. Well, thank you for watching Condo Insider. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have some more hot topics to talk about every Thursday, 3 o'clock. Share the knowledge with your friends about the show, and we look forward to you being with us again. Aloha.